So, this is probably going to be one of the best books that I've ever gone through. It is called How to Be a Millionaire, uh, Billionaire? Hmm? Billionaire by Martin Fritzen. Yes, it is rated 3 out of 10 by Derek Sivers. The link to this summary is always going to be down in the description, but I do want to point out that the little summary that he is, as always, giving to us, it doesn't seem to be that bad. You know, it actually sounds to be a pretty, pretty good book and a pretty interesting book, because a biographical look at billionaires from the last 200 years and lessons learned from how they did it. Some lessons aren't really applicable cable to the rest of us, like changing government laws to protect your monopoly, but some are, which uh, is pretty cool, I guess, and I'm very interested in it, and, and I don't know. I do want to point out, just because somebody is rating something uh, relatively low, does not by any means mean that um, it is also something that's not good, or bad, or whatnot. So, yeah, think about that, keep that in mind, and uh, yeah. I just wanted to point that out, you know, just because I think it is very interesting to always keep those things or some things in mind. Um, yeah, just uh, because. My notes. The less informed parties who wind up on a short end are not the ones who subsequently write autobiographies recounting their essence to billionaire status. The one objective that ties them all together, overcome the levelers. You must vanquish the mighty economic and social forces that conspire against your rise to massive wealth. Um, I do, by the way, just actually kind of believe in that. Uh, even though it sounds very direct and um, in this sense it is not good when things are direct because they very, very easily uh, come across as something, you know, rather strange and rather not very good. But I would I would actually say so. I would actually say so. Um, yeah. The levelers against which you must struggle are the menace of competition and the obstacle of solution conventions. Social conventions. If you succumb to them, you will never rise above a comparatively modest level of wealth. If you really want to have that, of course. And I've been talking to a great friend of mine, shout out to you, um, about wealth and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there is an amount of money that is just really nice to have just because you're able to really live a good life. But it is not about being a millionaire. It is not about being a billionaire. This is just not the point. Quite. You know, unless you really want to have that. Entrepreneurs uh, trapped in this system may pr prosper through general growth in the economy, but they will not become fabulously wealthy. To pull out of the pack, they must earn much higher profits than the economy as a whole, as the what profits than the economy as a whole is generating. In short, if you hope to be uh, become a billionaire, you must overcome the scourge of competition one way or the other, or another. Lawful sources of pricing power brand identity, patent protection, dominant market share, and sustainable cost advantage. In Walton's case, I think they're referring to Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. Uh, the key to obtaining lower costs was a willingness to violate the retailing industry norm of cordial relations with vendors. Walmart de uh, deviated even further from convention when it tried to go around manufacturers uh, represent... what? representatives to deal directly with manufacturers. Yeah, I think this is, you know, all of these things are quite interesting. I don't necessarily want to say important, but quite interesting. But but yeah, of course, I mean, uh, there's often just some things that are very industry, you know, very industry norm things. And, you know, this is just what you do if you're working in a certain industry. You know, this is how we have always done it and stuff like that. And this is often something that we should change, you know, just because it is impractical, just because it is inefficient, and just because maybe as well, it is merely costing us just quite a lot of money. Do not waste energy on the leveling tones of later day socialists who consider it a crime to get rich. Ignore as well the envious types who call you greedy. I mean, there's, there's going to be all sorts of people, you know, all sorts of people that are not really wishing you to be very wealthy. New ideas have given birth to many immense fortunes, but the original thinkers have not generally been the ones who made the fortunes. A more debatable strategy is to learn how to make money from ideas and then be prepared to capitalize on an original notion dreamed up by someone who is more skilled at that sort of thing. Even if it sounds very, like, just assholish, you know, if I can say that, I would say so. Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, prided himself on having appropriated nearly all of his good ideas from his com competitors, more than any of the other uh, retailing magnets. Yes, I think it's magnets. Magnets. However, Walton thoroughly understood how to turn ideas into dollars. Indeed. 
And this is not something that we all are able to do. You will not reach even the $100 million level without a clear focus and single-minded commitment. I mean, there's a lot of time that goes into that. And this is something that we all have to know and we all have to also expect. I know this is something that you just, that you have to keep in mind. It is something that you have to know is going to come. The best odds of becoming a billionaire, in summary, exist in industries that write the key trends of economic development. This suggests that in newly industrialized, what in newly industrializing countries, great opportunities may remain in infrastructure and basic industries. In the world's most developed economies, however, the cream of tomorrow's billionaires probably will emerge from communications, services, and technology. And I would fucking sign that. It is just totally the case. You know, it always depends on where you're living and it always depends on how developed this certain area is. Because if there is a need for something, um, this is going to grow potentially in the future. So yeah, the entrepreneur who pulls away from the pack in a young industry has a genuine shot at a billion dollar net worth. Who pulls away from the pack in a young industry. Well, yeah, this is actually well said. This is really well said, to be honest, because something that I'm often seeing is that people tend to really be like other people and do the same things as the competitor is doing. And yeah, no, why? It, you know, it is, it is actually supposed to not work quite. Overcome the leveling effects of competition by applying superior management skills or investing in political influence. Which, yeah, you know, well, I'm not going to say anything. Take extraordinary, extraordinary risks. So there's a few points there. Do business in a new way. Dominate your market. Consolidate an industry. Buy low, which always makes sense. Thrive on deals. Outmanage the competition, invest in political influence, resist the unions, pursue the money in ideas, which is something that I do not really want to kind of say, but yeah, rules are breakable, copying pays better than innovating, keep on growing, hold on to your, your equity, which is totally important, I think, even though it's just I shouldn't talk because I don't know anything about it, but I, I believe quite in it. Uh, hard work is essential. Use financial leverage. Keep that back door open, which is something that I often do. But sometimes I feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should really get into one thing and then, you know, just also burn all the burn all the bridges. But it's difficult. It's difficult to also generalize that. Make mistakes and then learn from them. Frugality pays. Enjoy the pursuit and develop a thick skin. But especially enjoy the pursuit. If it is something that you absolutely hate then chances are very small that you're going to get to quite a few things, I guess. He first asked the farmers to name a price for the drilling, uh, for the drilling rights on his land. Then Hunt hurried to, down, to town and offered the rights to an oil driller at a higher price. Once he had both sides of the trade in place, he would buy and sell nearly simultaneously, pocketing a profit without risking a nickel. Which is nice. Uh, even though there is some risk to that, you know, because who knows? Uh, the route chosen by Parrot and Wharton requires ex exceptional resistance to the levelers. If you sincerely want to be super rich, you cannot let yourself be, de be deterred by the unavoidable fact that change upsets people. Along with this key, which is definitely the case, by the way, along with this key instinct for turning a profit, a key ingredient in a key ingredient in Parrot's success was his ability to build an organization. He recruited self-starters like himself and let them operate with a minimum of uh, bureaucratic rules. <laughs> World's shortest procedural manual, do what makes sense. And I think this is actually very important because we often do a lot of things that don't make any sense. In whatever way, whether it is the sense of your gut, or whether it is the sense of your fucking hat, things make sense. Adopting the motto, whatever it takes, they put in extra, they put in excruciatingly long hours and projects that sometimes kept them away from home for months at a time. His methods uh, represent a veritable checklist of the techniques that can be cooled from studying the careers of the most successful money makers. In, many, in most cases, he carried the concept far beyond limits that ordinary mortals would find reasonable. And I would also sign that, you know, you... You kind of indeed have to be a bit crazy, you know, and have to overdo things quite, really. And you know, when it comes to building a great physique, when it comes to just really a lot of things, you quite have to overdo it. Um, what sets us apart, one said, in explaining Walmart's success, 
is that we train people to be merchants. We let them see all the numbers so they know exactly how they're doing within the store and within the company. They know their cost, their markup, their overhead and their profit. Success is more likely to occur to people who find intrinsic satisfaction and accumulation of wealth as opposed to the possession of wealth. Yes, totally the case. Totally the motherfucking case. Dominate your market, do business in a new way, take monumental risks, consolidate an industry, thrive on Dell's key principles or deals key, deals key, K E uh, S K E Y. Pursue the money in ideas, develop a thick skin, rules are breakable, copying pays better than innovating, keep on growing, hold on to your equi- equity, and hard work is essential. Once again, the same points. I don't know why, but they are just there, and I'm not gonna. Not gonna be unhappy about that, you know? Not gonna be unhappy about that. Um, uh, vaporware or where this term refers to the tactic of announcing a software product before it exists, typically to discourage rivals from proceeding with development of competing versions. <laughs> Is this actually something that we do? Fuck, man. High growth industries that most often spawn vast personal fortunes tend to be characterized by fiercely struggles for survival. No one is likely to emerge from such battles without a willingness to push the envelope. Like Sam Wharton, Gates exemplifies the success achievable by those who do not fall victim to the not invented, uh, not invented here syndrome. You know, just uh, copying from Apple and vice versa and stuff. And you know, we know the thing. And I often actually feel like, well, in, in the first place, I often feel like, well, why are they always just, why don't they think about something on their own? Why? But yeah, I mean, but in the end, I mean, there's trends and there's just some things that work very well. And why, if there's no patent or if there's no way or no reason for me to copy it, why shouldn't I? I mean, it's working well, it's good, it's great, it's, it's okay, it's, I can, why shouldn't I? Don't be too proud to take advantage of underserved good fortune. Operate it within the services category, uh, services category favoring rental businesses that generate recurring revenues. Operate it within the service, in, uh, service category uh, favoring rental businesses that generate recurring revenues. Oh, if I rent something, he explains, basically I'm selling the same thing over and over again. And yes, totally. Renting is a fucking cool thing for the person that is um, renting it, you know? So making money out of it. Yeah. I like it. This is also why I just really like just the idea of renting out homes and, and houses and whatever apartments. But the thing is, we, you have to buy them then. And they are fucking expensive. And to be able to live off of something like that, the rental business, I do think that you need a, just quite a lot of money at first. And taking on a credit for that is maybe not the best idea. And not, not necessarily, or not, you know, if you don't have any money, it, it is not a good idea, probably. But yeah, anyway. He was eager to move on, spurred less by the trappings of wealth than by the challenge of increasing it. Wayne uh, always keeps the carrot for enough out in front of him, and he never really wants to catch it, observes Dean Buntrock. That is his personality. He is never satisfied. Which can be something that's cool. I mean, in that sense, it is something that's quote-unquote cool. But if it is really the case that you can't just make yourself happy and stuff, then no. Nah. Nah. He once remarked that auto sales and rentals represented a trillion dollar market and that he only wanted his fair share. Half. (laughs) Half a trillion dollars. 500 billion. This is insane. Uh, associate, uh, associates report being sent back to the negotiation table 15 times or more until they emerge with terms that satisfy him. A quote-unquote deal, uh, Hugh Senga once told an interviewer with a smile, it's like chasing a girl, you work at it until she says yes. Which is definitely the fucking case. Definitely. Uh, determined to realize his vast ambitions, uh, Hugh Senga labored hard to master his emotions and channel his immense energy productively. What could be less complicated than pursuing purchasing an asset when nobody wants it, than selling it when no one can live without it? Totally the case. 
but you just have to know that. And I think this is the art um, behind that. If it is truly as simple as that, why isn't everybody rich? The standard answer offered by financial gurus is that most inventors lose their nerve when they see the crowd rushing toward the exit. Proactive behavior is one common theme to watch for as you read the following sketches of champions bargain hunters. Observe as well the two distinct ways in which billionaires squeeze pennies until they scream. Not only do they pay as little as possible for the assets they buy, but they relentlessly strive to reduce the operating costs of their properties. Meanwhile, in 1929, the stock market crashed, while others despaired, um, Getty, what? Getty recognized the debacle as a golden opportunity to satisfy his predilection for paying bottom dollar. Thanks to the plunge in oil company shares, petroleum could be found more cheaply on Wall Street than in the oil patch. It was foolish, Getty reasoned, to buy oil properties with $100 when you could buy them indirectly with maybe 50 cent dollars. Which is half, which is always good. Um, yeah, Lawrence Tisch's immense wealth derives mainly from buying low and selling high. Observers commonly overlook the negotiation skill that has enabled him to obtain bargains that otherwise might have gone to his rivals. A typical assessment runs along these lines. To triumph as often as he says or has, Tish or whatever, has thumbled his nose at conventional wisdom. He buys companies or stocks when they are widely unpopular and shuns anything that is remotely in vogue. In many such comments over the years, the, uh, the press has celebrated Tish's knack or knack for finding value while obscuring his effectiveness in adding value. Buying when others appear to be panicking sometimes proves nothing except that there was good reason to panic. And yes, and actually, I'm willing to end this episode with that because it's, I think, a very good point in the opposite direction. It's not always good. Just buy whenever everyone is selling and stuff. No. Yes. Yes. Not necessarily. Like, there's there is always two sides of a coin. And yeah, I wish you the best health of happiness and all success and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person than being remembered as a nice person, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. Um, three other questions that I'm have for you are why are you here? What are you trying to change and what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business city, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. And yeah, another question that I'm have for you is what could you essentially say that is really going to make somebody's life better or whatever and so on. And yeah, with that being said, I'm hopefully going to see you the next time. Bye bye. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart and I'm going to see you. I hope please stay self safe and healthy or selfie. Fuck. Yeah. Anyway, safe and healthy. Bye-bye.